Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are live from the Baptist Health newsroom today. Uh, I'm Velasca Valencia. Today we have our guest, Dr. Jaramillo, neurologist from the Baptist Health Neuroscience Center, and Amy Exum, licensed mental health counselor and psychotherapist at Baptist Health. Today we're talking all about screen time. We are not limiting this segment to just children. We understand that adults are constantly on their phones, on their iPads, those that work remotely, playing video games. So we definitely wanna open up this discussion for all ages. Um, so definitely drop in your questions and let us know um, if you have any questions, any concerns, and we'll definitely touch on all those topics. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, when we think of screen time, um, again, our minds go directly to infants, but we're definitely living in an age of YouTube, where kids are not watching television anymore, adults are binging on Netflix. So Dr. Jaramillo, as it pertains to infants, which is where I feel like we can definitely hone in and, and pretty much like get the time that we need and address parents on the guidelines, what are the pediatric guidelines as it relates to screen time? So we refer to, um, you know, really the authority when it comes to children, um, infants, and uh, what's really recommended based on the data, the research that we have so far. This is what they look at to make their guidelines and their recommendations. So as it stands, uh, in 2016, they changed their guidelines, and it states that children 18 months or younger, 18 to 24 months and younger, should probably have zero screen time with the exception of some video chatting, saying hi to grandma and grandpa. Um, between 24 months and, um, or two years and five years, they recommend um, at a maximum of one hour per uh, day of high quality programming. So that's really educational type, type of screen time. Um, and beyond five years, it's really an individualized media plan. Um, as it relates to screen time and as a parent, I think we've all been guilty, not all, but most of using electronic devices as a babysitter. So it's very easy to say that, oh, 18 months is really young, but if you need to run out and do some errands or go grocery shopping or take a quick shower, it's very easy to hand a device to a child and have them entertain themselves while you have a minute or two to yourself. But what are the long-term uh, brain development impacts by introducing these devices to a child so young? It's, uh, that's a million dollar question. It's a very hard question to answer. Uh, there's a lot of data out there and uh, the good thing is that um, there are more and more studies that, that are being started because it's such an important topic. Um, some studies have gone as far as to get MRIs on children uh, at X amount of months after they've been exposed to a certain amount of screen time. And they've looked at things like cortical thinning or the outer layer of the brain, the way it may thin in some of these kids. Um, but the problem with that kind of data is that uh, children's brains are very plastic, as we say. Uh, they rewire constantly. And it's based on their experiences and what they're exposed to. Uh, but it's very hard to have data stating that it's a cause-effect type of relationship. So a lot of the studies we have so far really um, they are trying to build the case and really they're proving associations. Um, kids that are exposed to excessive screen time have an associated lower um, performance on specific uh, psychosocial um, tests and cognitive tests. Now that you bring up tests, um, once you enter elementary school, a lot of the programs that the kids are doing, um, whether they're getting their homework from there, doing their homework, is online. Uh, once you get to high school, um, I have a 14-year-old in ninth grade, everything where he gets all of his assignments are through an app. And a lot of the work now done in high school is through groups, so they constantly have to be on chat, so I can't really set any guidelines on removing his devices. Um, and other than sending in your questions for our experts today, please drop in the comments what kind of guidelines you set at home. 
Um, at my house, Monday through Friday, absolutely no video games because again, I can't control the devices too much because that's where they're doing their homework. Um, Amy, in your field as a therapist, how do you see the impact on overusage of screen time and too much time playing video games? What are the impacts you see from a mental health counselor perspective? Well, you know, we, we constantly think about how this is affecting the brain, and, and I want to also mention that it affects their physical health too, which in turn affects how, you know, we're feeling. So, you know, if we're spending extended periods of time on a tablet or phone or a laptop, that probably means we're not getting outside, right. um, we're not exercising, and we're staying sedentary, which isn't necessarily a good thing for us, right? We want to be moving around. So if we're staying sedentary, it probably means that we're not feeling physically well. Um, you know, I know if I sit around for too long, I just don't feel, you know, I don't right. feel physically well. I've got to get around and move, move and move. Um, we're also not getting, you know, getting outside, being able to exercise, uh, play sports with other people, learn those important social interactions of, of how it is to make eye contact with someone. Right. You know, how do you greet someone? How, how do you have these interactions beyond what's happening behind the screen? It's very different being able to type something and not having any really immediate repercussions versus having a conversation with someone face to face. Um, so it's, it really affects so many aspects, the physical aspect, the mental aspect. You know, also we can, you know, if we're sitting in front of the TV, it's really easy to snack. So right. we could, we're often not snacking on things that are healthy, things like potato chips. And so again, that affects our physical health, which becomes a cycle of affecting our physical health, our overall well-being, and our mental health. And not limiting this conversation to just children, you talk about communication. Um, mm -hmm. Briefly before the segment started, we talked about how you've been seeing a lot of couples. Um, yes. Now, as far as it relates to relationships and communication, mm -hmm. that is one of the key factors in a successful relationship. But if you're constantly on the phone, there's a lot of adults who play online gaming, mm -hmm. um, or what if you work remotely? Give us some feedback and some insight on how you've been helping your adult couples in in those type of scenarios. Sure. Well, you know, I, I, I talk about how do I have this healthy relationship mm -hmm. with my social media, with my whatever my devices are, because as you said, you know, we can mm -hmm. not we can mm -hmm. become more involved with our social media or with our work than with our relationship, and it becomes a really good reason to not have to talk to. <laughs> Right. my loved one in the moment, right? Because I'm really busy with work. Um, but what ends up happening is we spend less and less quality time together, you know, even with children. Hanging out is no longer, you know, playing with a game, you know, or some, you know, some kind of toy together. It's sitting next to each other on the devices and playing a game with each other. That's hanging out with your friends. So, you know, same thing with relationships. We end up uh, becoming disengaged because it's really easy to get caught up in, in reading something on the news or, or you know, looking at something with work, just a really quick, funny story. You know, I was eating dinner with a friend of mine and I, there was a couple next to, to me and my friend and I realized the entire meal, they had their phone in their hand and were looking at the phone, never actually said a word to each other. At one point, the cup, one of the couple had was missing their food because oh. they would not put they wouldn't put right. their phone down so they couldn't actually get the food <laughs> into right. their mouth because they were so focused on their phone so this can really cause relationship issues you know we don't we aren't able to communicate we aren't able to feel connected and bonded with other people and we can actually feel more isolated than more connected which right. is really the contrary of what people think when we think about phone social media FaceTime and there are some restaurants out there that actually like make you drop in your phone right before you start having dinner. Um, so they're doing something right. But you had mentioned uh, this being a genera generational uh, issue. issue. Right. What's your take on that? You know, uh, first it was radio. How right. much is too right. much radio? <laughs> right. Then TV, and now we have all the above. Yeah. And so it's hard to. Um, avoid the progression of things and this is where we are right now you can't avoid it I think that you just have to uh, when it comes to children you have to set limits set limits for yourself set a good example yeah. and stay tuned to the data that we have because it's forever changing so like Dr. Jaramillo is saying technology is not going away we need to embrace it for what it is but again set the guidelines and the limitations now at one point from a brain development or neurologist perspective, does this liking uh, to either social media or Netflix or YouTube or gaming become an addiction? Like, how is there a way to determine or when 
there's signs that we need to look for as to when this becomes a problem? You know, one of the uh, studies that uh, recently came out um, in the uh, JAMA Pediatrics Journal, they made a comparison uh, with social media, screen time, and junk food, mm. right? Yeah. It's very hard to make a guideline as to how much junk food is okay for everyone, right? And so this is the kind of problems that we run into when we try to generalize and give a guideline on something like screen time that has so many variables. We're all so different, our brains respond so differently to different things. Right. So uh, when it comes to addiction, I, I think it, the same uh, things apply to anything uh, that you can get addicted to. Whenever it's controlling you, whenever it's um, replacing other things that uh, you do for general health, uh, healthy sleep, good sleep hygiene as we call Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Exercise, good eating habits, um, you know, and then you get into more uh, specific things like face-to-face -face interactions um, and uh, things with children and parents. Absolutely. Now, I know it's not very easy, right, if a parent or someone in a relationship is faced with asking themselves, is this an addiction? Has this person crossed the line? Amy, explain to us from a therapist, like how, when is it okay to talk um, to your child or if not to your child, to a specialist or an expert to see if in fact it is addiction? Well, I'm a big fan of prevention. Right. So I would say, you know, as, as soon as possible or as soon as you even have to have some concerns, go ahead and talk to someone because, you know, we're here to say, yes, you know, here are some things that we can do to help you prevent this from becoming more serious of a problem. Or, yes, you know, you do need more treatment because this is going to help you in X, Y, and Z way. So I say have a conversation from very early on, you know. Th as Dr. Jaramillo said, this isn't going away. So yeah. we need to have these conversations and be pretty, you know, open and honest as developmentally appropriate with children because they're growing up with this. I, I didn't grow up, you know, with the internet ac yeah, at all. easy access. And right. how am I going to use this in a way that's safe and healthy for me? Yeah. Um, last week, if you saw our segment on Care on Demand, which is an app-based uh, healthcare app, we did the segment basically, basically for urgent care, you know, now that we're in the midst of flu season, but we are now offering mental health services. And Amy, I understand that you're one of the experts that people are able to choose. Give us an example of, you know, walk us through the visit from, an, from a device, right? Sure, like we're sure. talking about screen time, but if it's 10 o'clock at night and you feel like you want to talk to someone, that is the beauty of having a healthcare app opposed to waiting till the next day and maybe you don't want to talk about it anymore. Right, yeah, the, the immediacy or even being able to, you know, go and step into your car in the middle of a work day. If you're right. having something stressful happen, to just step away, find a private place, you can log on through the Care On Demand app from your phone, your tablet. <laughs> Right. Your PC. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, there is a selection of providers, just like there is for urgent care. You can see the information and, and the provider's background and their availability, if they're available now or if they have an appointment time you can make with them. We also have our psychiatrist, Dr. Rachel Rohide, on there as well. So um, it's just a really convenient, easy way. The um, Baptist Healthcare and Counseling Therapists are all on there. And it's just a really nice way, especially if, you know, sometimes people are very concerned about that face to face interaction the first right. time it, it it's scary if you've never seen a therapist before for some people to walk into that office um, this is a really nice introduction to get to know who you'll be seeing um, or maybe it's just convenient because you live far away and you want to be able to to you know like I said do it during your lunch time absolutely mm -hmm. so just information on that you go to the app store it's care on demand um, no insurance is required for any of our visits um, for this segment for a mental health counselor, the office visit is $99 on Care On Demand. Um, if you use promo code WELLBEING, you get $10 off your first visit. And again, it's for any topic. Um, how about anxiety? Does, it, it all ties in, right? Like you're playing for fun, you're viewing for fun, then we wonder if it becomes an addiction. At what point does it get to possibly be anxiety that you need to get on and play or you need to get on social media to see what a specific person is posting 
if either of you want to take that question. I mean, I think that symptom of anxiety, um, you know, kind of hints at maybe the start of an ad addictive type relationship with the, de the device. So, um, you know, and it's an interesting thing because anxiety is one of the um, psychiatric distresses that are documented in studies that looked at uh, kids with excessive screen time and the rate or the prevalence of things like depression, anxiety, um, you know, low self-esteem. Right. And it's, it's clear that um, there's an association there. Now, it's not a cause and effect as we understand it right now because there's so many variables, you know. There is uh, varying parenting skills. Is it that kids that uh, have parents with less skills are exposed to more, more screen time because of that? And then all of the other ramifications. Uh, obesity because right. of it. Uh, so decreased effect. F physical activity. Uh, effects on sleep. These are things that we really don't have good answers to yet right. because there's conflicting data. Right. All right, so we're going to start. Uh, we're getting in some questions. How young is too young to let your kids use devices in a limited fashion? <laughs> limited fashion is very <laughs> broad. I, you know, so again, I, I think that you, if you want to be scientific about this, uh, you know, I would recommend sticking to the American Academy of Pediatrics right. guidelines because they're looking at the research we have thus far and they're making the best recommendations for the society as a whole. So I think that um, I would have to agree that children 18 months or even 24 months and younger really should not be yeah. exposed to screen time. They really should not. Um, you know, what difference is it going to make if you do an hour here and there? Nobody really knows the answer to that. Uh, but I think as a general guideline, I would say that uh, 24 months and younger really outside of video chatting, uh, no screen time, and then limited uh, less than one hour for preschool age children because of the data we have so far in the associations to uh, increase psychiatric distress, uh, lower uh, psychosocial well-being. Uh, I would stick to that. Yeah, agreed. Now we talked about um this era that we are in is generational, but we grew up watching TV, right? Like that was our screen time. So is that any different for kids being further away from the TV than a handheld a iPad, you know, <laughs> being right in front of their face? A another unanswered question. Right. I mean, I'm right. sure there is uh, eye-related issues to bright screens okay. and, and, you know, these things. Uh, but also, what's the effect of focusing in on the screen time versus multitasking and being exposed to it. We don't know what the difference is there. So, um, you know. All right, we're getting in a lot of questions. Is there a certain time of the day that is best to allow kids a few minutes of screen time? Um, Dr. Hanamio, feel free to join in on this one, but I would say, you know, further away from bedtime. Correct. Because, yeah. um, you know, and, and I would say not just for children. I, I see many people and sometimes they come see me for sleep issues, having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up in the middle of the night. And that's one of the first recommendations I make. I actually try to tell people to stay away from screen time for two hours. I right. know that's really hard. Before <laughs> you go to bed, it's hard for me. Um, but especially if you're having sleep issues, that's really important. So I would say further away from bedtime as can be. I don't know anything beyond further away from bedtime if you have to add. The American Academy of Pediatrics are specific as to you know how long, uh, how much time between the time you shut off the device and bedtime, they say 30 minutes, and they recommend um, no devices within the bedroom. Correct, uh, yes. Of the children. Um, so that, you know, that's what, what they have so far as a recommendation. And again, drop in the comments the guidelines that are set in your house. I'll just throw in another rule that I have in my house. Dr. Jaramillo just said it. We're not allowed to charge phones in the room because what's the first thing that you do when you wake up? It's like you're still laying down and you're like, you know, yeah. looking up at the phone. Or at night, we're thinking the kids are sleeping when in fact they're scrolling through their phone. So I'd like to just say one more thing on yeah. that same uh, topic is that I'm a neurologist, but I'm a sleep specialist as well. And um, one of the things that I always talk about with my patients, because insomnia is one of the biggest right. reasons why I see a sleep uh, disorder patient in my office, 
um, is something called sleep hygiene. There has to be a protection of the environment in which we sleep because when, um, you know, as people get older and they form these habits, once they start having problems with insomnia, it's very hard to go backwards decades of certain habits. So it's really key to promote, um, you know, very healthy sleep habits with children. Right. Because once they get into adulthood, if they haven't really okay. practiced that, it's almost impossible to, to deal with. And one of the right. worst situations uh, is not being able to sleep, uh, being exposed to different drugs that could have side effects, and then they stop working eventually. So okay. there's a big connection there, I think, with sleep, sleep quality, sleep time, and the devices. So it's, inter it's interesting because the topic today is screen time, but we've hit anxiety, addiction, now sleep. Um, and again, we know technology is not going away. And as we've been speaking, we all know that this is part of our field now, right? Like the way the world is evolving and our job roles are evolving. Um, you know, I have to, as social media manager for Baptist Health, I constantly have to be checking. And you as a physician, I'm sure you're getting called or emailed. You, Amy, you're getting all these calls. So again, I think it's important to say that it's not going away, but it's very important for us to set those guidelines okay. at home, at work. Um, so Amy, a question for you. How have you seen this affect adult relationships? Sure, um, arguments within, right. you know, within couples. Um, again, people feeling lonely, even though you're in the same home with someone, if you're both on the devices, how much time are we actually, how much quality time are we actually spending with each other? Um, social media arguments, I've seen this happen between couples regularly okay. you know the person you know my wife my husband didn't comment on my my Facebook right. post my you know my Instagram yeah. post or you know they made a nasty comment on it so it just allows another platform <laughs> Right. for us to play out some of the issues that we have. Um, but it, it really takes away from that bonding. And, and bonding is so important you from, from babies up to adults to feel that we're connected to something. And so if we're missing out on connections because we're so glued to our phones or our laptops, you know, those relationships are going to struggle. So, you know, I, I haven't yet seen anyone threaten divorce, but major issues where couples have to come in. We have to talk about, you know, what's really going on here because of social media arguments or feeling that they're being left out because of overworking or, or just too much screen time or video gaming or binge watching TV. Right. And um, talking about video gaming, now they have online gaming where it's live, where you're speaking to someone in Germany or someone in California and you live in Florida, what are the concerns and exposures for kids and adults with this whole online gaming sure. craze now with the PS4 and the Nintendo Switch that they're putting out games? What's the right. need for that and the live streaming? Yeah, so, you know, when when we start interacting with these this live gaming, you know, we open ourselves up to cyberbullying, which right. is becoming a, you know, a major issue right now. Cyberbullying and then, you know, in a, you know, content that might be not be appropriate for young children. And, you know, there's the YouTube Kids channel right. um, that's supposed to be monitored. We, you know, I don't know how many videos are posted per second online. It's right. really hard. And sometimes things slip through and, and you can't really take that back after somebody's seen it. Um, you know, so we have those aspects. I, I do want to, you know, I don't want to vilify social media or right. video gaming or any of this. So I just want to mention, you know, there are really good aspects of it too. You know, there are certain people who live in remote areas and they don't right. have the ability to interact with people, you know, because they live very remotely. So social media does give them that access. You know, care on demand does give people access mm -hmm. to mental health who may not have um, providers nearby them. And then also for people, you know, who have disabilities. I, I did see a, a show recently that, um, you know, video game conferences for individuals who can't, you know, are paraplegics or quadriplegics, and this gives them an opportunity to interact with other people in ways that they may have not been able to before. So I just wanted to mention that because no, I know we're talking a lot about the negative, sure. you know, it's yeah. all about our relationship to it because there are healthy ways we can interact with our, with our tablets and our phones. Right. And again, everyone's family dynamic is different. Um, someone asked us earlier, like, what time should they get off? Everyone has different schedules. So again, it's the importance of setting that family plan and those guidelines and those rules. And I'm hoping people are 
sending in their suggestions of what works for them at home. You never know who might be reading the comments and they can apply it to their family plan. Um, another question coming in, what tips do you have both for kids and adults to set parameters or limitations for screen time? Sure, well, I, you know, I would say, um, just as Dr. Haramiya was talking about, you know, limitations on when to have a screen time before sleep, you know, you can even set limitations on which rooms Correct. are we allowed to use devices in. And even for, you know, some of the younger children you want to monitor more, you know, having a larger screen and saying, you know, on this computer, this is where we use social media so that you have access to be able to see what's going on. Um, did I answer the question completely? Can I get the question again? You had mentioned sure. earlier uh, <laughs> something about social media detox. Oh, the social media yeah. detox. Yeah, so, you know, the, it's a new thing. I've heard right. people doing, you know, <laughs> taking 30 days or two months off of social media. And I, I would say if you're interested in it, try it. You, you never know what might happen. I know there was a study that was done on college students and um, having them monitor their time on social media and then limit their time on social media. And for those college students, they found that actually they had um, better self-esteem, better relationships, and they actually weren't paying attention. They didn't realize how much time they were spending on social media. Right. So, uh, you know, go for it. Try it if you're, if you're into it and, and see what kind of face-to-face -face interactions you can have. You might be missing out on something. Right. <laughs> so someone like me, that is my job, but there's something great about social media, it's called unfollow, right? <laughs> so <laughs> instead of going into this 30 day detox, maybe unfollow either okay. some people or some uh, Instagram or Facebook accounts that may not be you know, working <laughs> in your favor and start following you know, some more positive accounts so it is out there. So as we wrap up, um, some last thoughts from a brain development perspective and as technology continues to evolve and I don't think we'll ever be able to catch up of what the next steps are, are there any concerns or anything that you want to tell the audience as far as to keep on top of? Um, I think the exciting thing is that this has become more like a global issue mm -hmm. uh, because I think everyone recognizes how important it is what are the consequences for our children, what are they going to develop into, what, what are they going to lack uh, as they grow into adulthood. So, you know, there's a lot of big studies out there now, uh, big numbers, we're talking 20, 40,000 patients. Uh, you know, the limit of these studies, though, is that they're usually observational studies. They require self-reporting in terms of how much time they're in front of the screen. Um, and so, uh, as far as brain development, I think this is uh, still, the jury is out. We really don't know. Uh, the exact consequences because there's a lot of confounding factors. And I'm really glad that you brought up the whole sleep aspect of it because I think it's important for our audience to know, again, I know that's not the topic, but of how the trickle effect of how screen time can affect so many things. And last thoughts, Amy. You know, I, I would say use use your electronic devices to your benefit. You know, we, there's lots of apps to, to help us be mindful, to be present, right. to disconnect, tells us how much time we have been spending on the screen. You know, use it to, the, to our advantage rather than letting it run us. And one of those apps that Amy's talking yeah. about, just again, <laughs> it's Care On Demand app. Download that. For more information on Dr. Jaramillo on the Neuroscience Center, visit baptisthealth.net slash neuroscience. And for more information on Amy and her team is baptisthealth.net slash Karen Counseling. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next live segment. Have a good day.